Good morning. It is great to be with you today. We have certainly come together to praise God, to be edified by His Word, to encourage one another. And you being here is encouraging to me. And We know that we have some that are online watching. They're unable to make it to our assembly this morning. We're, we're grateful that you have tuned in or will tune in later this afternoon uh, for the service. I want to bring our final lesson that we've been in for some weeks. In fact, uh, we have been in our study of Ephesians, the letter of Ephesians, for 16 weeks now. And I want to bring this final lesson to a close this morning. And really, I have a twofold aim. I really want to go back to where we were. We've been in Ephesians chapter 6 for three weeks, so that's where we'll be this morning. And I want to go back and complete that list of the armor that we began looking at last week. And then I want to try to help us to see how these final verses in this letter, God-given letter, connects us to God and how certainly we can tap into the power of God in our personal battle against temptation. The New Testament makes reference to some military terms. If you read through the New Testament, you have noticed that on occasions. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3, the apostle tells Timothy to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And I have some concern when I hear those terms about being good soldiers or the idea of those military terms. And, and my concern lies not within Timothy. My concern lies in the fact that how many believers today really see themselves as soldiers in a battle. We are in a battle, and there is a battle for our souls, a battle against temptation, a battle that the devil seeks to throw his fiery flames or darts or arrows, as Ephesians chapter 6 reads, towards us. And so I know that my concern is that our battles tend to be this time of the year, with all the rain we've had, our battles tend to be weeds. Or maybe today, with this wonderful potluck that we're going to enjoy, maybe, maybe the battle is maybe fighting off that second helping of dessert. And not so much in our minds, maybe, that we are soldiers in a battle. And I'm aware that there are some members in this church family that can readily relate to military terms found in the scripture. And you can relate because you have been a good soldier on the battlefield, the literal battlefield. And so the, therefore you can relate in a much greater way than the rest of us. But all of us need to understand that we are in a battle and we need to be good soldiers. I said last week there's no escaping this battle. There is no neutral conflict in this battle. There is no truce that can be negotiated. No peace treaty can be signed. In this battle, we either win it God's way or the enemy defeats us. Ephesians chapter 6, I want to pick up our reading in verse 10. And understand that God is giving us this chapter as he has the Bible. To help us be victorious over sin. And so in verse 10 the scripture says. Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers and against the authorities. And against the powers of this dark world. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Put on the armor of God so that when the day of evil comes. You may be able to stand your ground and after everything or after you've done everything to stand. We have heard the phrase, timing is everything. And so it is in the spiritual battle. The enemy schemes his invasions against us. And timing is everything. In fact, paramount to his success in these battles that he sends us with temptation is the element of surprise. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, 
And this is at the end of Jesus' successful resistance, by the way, to the devil's temptations there in the, the desert wilderness. The Bible tells us that he left him for a more opportune time. The New International Version, the English Standard Version, the New King James Version, and the New American Standard Bible are just some of the many translations that read opportune time. The opportune time it means a moment in which the conditions are most favorable for Satan to attack. In military terminology, it means danger zone. In Ephesians 6, verse 13, the apostle calls that opportune time the evil day. This is the day that Satan thinks that when he brings those temptations your way, the circumstances are the most ideal for those temptations that you might yield to those temptations and he would succeed in this battle. Now the fact is that there are opportune times would also tell us there's inopportune times. There are times Satan advances and there are times he retreats. There are times that he invades and there are times that he departs. And if we're persistent in resisting our this battle with temptation, if we're persistent in resisting the devil, the Bible does say he will flee for a time because he realizes that's not an opportune time. James chapter 4, verse 6 tells us, and this is important in our battle with temptation, it's important to have a spirit of humility. The Bible says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And then in that very next verse, he says, Submit yourselves then to God, you know, because you understand the importance of being humble in heart. Understand that you need God's power in the battle. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Interestingly, the word submit, as I looked it up here in verse 7, it has a military kind of term. It, it references a military kind of term. It means literally to get into proper rank. When the private, in his arrogance, acts like a general, he's going to be in trouble. And so God gives grace on the battlefield to the humble in heart who will acknowledge his power over the enemy. And we need to tap into God's power. Now listen to Ephesians 6, verse 17 and 18. The Bible says, Take the helmet of salvation. Now this is where we pick up the armor from last week. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, it says, Be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So the Apostle wraps up his list of the armor by saying, take the helmet of salvation. The metaphor of the helmet in the Christian armor is one of the most important pieces because the head is a particularly vulnerable part of the body. A blow to the arm or the leg may be extremely painful, but a blow to the head and all of a sudden you are seeing stars and hearing birds sing whether the stars are out or whether the birds are singing. You see, a blow to the leg, it, it hurts. And you can even find to have a broken leg when you have a blow to the leg. But a blow to the head, and it can be fatal. And that's why football players and, and bicycle riders wear helmets. That's why construction workers wear hard hats. And anyone who would dare to skateboard, they wear protection. Because they don't want to have that blow to the head. And one of the things here, when, when the apostle was telling us to put on the helmet of salvation, I just want to remind us. Paul is not telling them to get saved. Because they are saved. They are in the church in Ephesus. The emphasis here is now that you are saved, now that you have obeyed the gospel as presented in the book of Acts. Take hold of the assurance of salvation. Because Satan wants to continually bring forth doubt that God's cleansing power is what it really is. It's able to cleanse us of our sin. And so Satan clubs us with doubt and our shortcomings and he tries to discourage us. 
He tries to get us to, to, to surrender to the reality that, 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 that our sins have not been, been forgiven. And yet we know the Bible says they have. And certainly the, the helmet of salvation will help us against the vicious attacks that he tries to club us with doubt and discouragement. The helmet of salvation protects us from losing confidence, you see, in the God who saves. Satan will try to crush our assurance of salvation. We take the helmet off, we're going to be defeated. We keep the helmet on, we can withstand Satan's club. Verse 17 gives us another piece of the armor. It is, the apostle says, the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible says is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the power of God that will help us to stand up against Satan, against the enemy, against temptations. I invite you to look with me if you want to open your Bible to Matthew 4. It might hold your finger here, but we'll come back. But Matthew 4 a moment. You know, I said Luke chapter 4, verse 13, about the opportune time. That's Luke's account. In Matthew 4, he has, Matthew has his account. They're both the accounts of what you might say the original desert storm. That is, the, the conflict of the ages between good and evil there in, in that 40-day period of time where the devil is tempting Jesus in the wilderness. And Luke and Matthew both gives us Jesus' battle plan for victory against temptation. The same weapon that Jesus used, and Jesus was the Son of God, but He also was in the flesh, and He did not rely on the power of God outside of the Word of God to withstand temptation or these, these temptations. And the same weapon that was available to Him that brought Him victory over temptation is available to us. Listen to Matthew 4, verse 1. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Understand Jesus was in the flesh. And understand, after 40 days, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Hebrews 4 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. Every way tempted as we are, but was without sin. Just a reminder, Jesus was tempted in ways that we were never, we have never been, or we will ever be tempted. We have never been tempted to turn stones to bread. Because we don't have the power to turn stones to bread. What we can do is use the Word of God just as Jesus did against these temptations or these schemes of the devil. But Satan doesn't give up easily. We, we know that from our own lives. Matthew chapter 4 verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against stone. Notice here, the devil is actually quoting Scripture to Jesus. But he is misusing it. He's twisting it, distorting it. So after the devil quotes God's words in the second temptation, the Bible says Jesus answered him. And he says, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. The sword of the Spirit can be used offensively and defensively. Three times Jesus defended himself with the Scripture, and then we find that he also would in return, on one occasion, use specific words to be on the offense against these temptations. This is Matthew 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the splendor. He says, all this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, 
For it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. With individual passages of Scripture, we can resist the devil and drive him back even when he inappropriately uses Scripture. Satan is a master of counterfeits, <clears throat> and he will twist Scripture. That is why <clears throat> we need to read our Bibles. That's why we need to study our Bibles. And that is why David of old said in Psalms 119, verse 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. He that is in us, 1 John 4, verse 4, He that is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Victory is through faith in Jesus. Remember, Satan is always looking for an opportune time. And the opportune time is when we disconnect from the Word of God. Jesus repeatedly said, it is written, it is written. And when we hold on to the God's Word and we take that shield of faith that we talked about last week, when we couple the armor of God with that which is written, then we can be victors instead of victims to Satan's flaming arrows. Now there are two more components here that we need to connect to the armor of God. And if we miss this connection, we will only end up running in circles. And we'll end up being spiritually depleted and spiritually defeated. When I think of running in circles, I remember a hamster that we had when our children were very young. If you've never had a hamster, you didn't miss anything except sleep. And if you had a hamster, you know why I would say that. Nearly all hamster cages come with a wheel, either on the end of the cage or attached to the cage. And our wheel at the end of the cage, well, that wheel would go around and around and around. Our hamster slept during the day. But at night, when I was trying to read or study or when we were trying to sleep in the household, that hamster would climb on that wheel and that wheel would go around and around. And it wasn't a quiet thing either. Well, the wheel goes around, but it goes nowhere. The hamster in a wheel syndrome explains the way, from my view, the way some folks live their lives. They go around and around and they're busy, but they're not making forward progress with God. Satan is winning the battle for their souls. Fortunately, by the grace of God, most of us here have figured out that life without God is meaningless. It's going nowhere. The hamster in the wheel syndrome explains the sin syndrome to some extent. I'll mention something more about that in a moment. Listen to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the preacher of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the inspired preacher, goes on this search for meaning in life. Twelve chapters in, as he brings things to a conclusion, he says this, Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole, basically the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. As we put on the armor of God, let us be sure to connect these two components. We need to pray, and we need to stay alert. If you just put on the armor, and you stop there, you're still going to have a problem in the battle, to the point where you're not going to be victors, you're going to be a victims. So we need to pray, we need to always pray, and keep on praying, and this is very important. Because if we neglect prayer, I would suggest, I believe, that we will end up running in circles. We're not going to go anywhere, if we, if we don't pray, we're not going to go anywhere that's going to promote spiritual growth or spiritual victory. Ephesians 6 verse 18, he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. 
Pray also for me, Paul says, whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me so that I may be fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And so we know the command is very clear here that to, to pray is right along the side of the arm. And I think Paul knew from his own experience, his personal experience, but he knew from as he looked around that there are people that had fallen victims to what I call life on the wheel. This included people who never became Christians, never believed in God, and he wanted to get the message out to those people. But it also included some people that came to faith, but didn't fully commit themselves. And, and in time, in time, they gave into Satan's temptations, and they made that disconnect from the Word of God, and they found themselves spiritually depleted and defeated. And they returned, as a result, to the same old, same old. And they lived again without eternal hope. One night our hamster got out of the cage. Not a good thing. We looked all day, pretty much, all that day, and into the night. And we couldn't find the hamster anywhere. Do you remember that? <laughs> Someone told me the next day that, that sometimes hamsters will return to the cage. They'll often return to the cage if they can get into the cage. I thought, that sounds really strange. But I said, what do I have to lose? So I made a little ramp up to the cage. I refreshed the water. I refreshed the food. And the next night, in the middle of the night, sleeping, and all of a sudden, I hear the noise, round and around and around. I jump up. I run. I run in there. I shut that cage to never, ever be opened again. <laughs> I had to open it again, I guess. But, but I bring that up because the hamster in a wheel syndrome can be paired, I think, at times to the sin syndrome. Satan tries to get us so comfortable in the pattern of sin... That when freedom is available, when a person knows that there's freedom there, they may neglect it or they rebel against it. Sometimes they just think the good news is just too good to be true. And so they choose to live life on the wheel. And that can only promise an unfulfilled life. We know God's word is true. We know that no matter what, no matter the battles that we have here in the spiritual realm, it's worth hanging on to God and his word with all of our mind. The good news tells us how we can be delivered from sin and put on the road to heaven. The good news is that Jesus shed his sinless blood for us on the cross, became the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and now we have the opportunity to place our faith in Jesus, repent of our sin, and be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sin. And we can avoid, if we do this, a spiritual collision by putting on the armor, by praying and staying alert to Satan's schemes. The final verses talk about the peace of God, the love of God, and the grace of God. That's in Jesus Christ. Paul uses those terms as he closes out this letter. So this morning I ask, if you feel like you've been spinning your wheels on the battlefield as far as temptation goes, we'll resolve to go with God and take your stand on His Word. If we can help you in a public way this morning, why don't you come as we stand and sing.